on today's show, I'm reviewing the absolute mess that was left field for the Rangers this year. What did we learn from the players who played left field? And what is the fix for next year? Because it cannot go on like this next year if the Rangers want to compete for the playoffs. All that and more on this episode of Locked on Rangers. Let's get into it. You are Locked on Rangers. Your daily Texas Rangers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. You are Locked On to the Texas Rangers. I'm Bryce Patrick, a cripplingly addicted Texas Rangers fan since 2010, the founder and host for all four seasons of this Locked On Rangers podcast. Today is Tuesday. November 1st, we are finally in November, and we are actually going to get Game 3 of the World Series today. Everything was pushed back because of rain. But thank you all so much for making Locked On Rangers your first listen every single day. If you're not already, you can follow me on Twitter at Bryce Patrick. You can follow the show at Locked On Rangers and subscribe on YouTube, where the best way that you can help grow the show is to comment any single thing below. Now, on today's show, we're going to break down what happened in left field because... It, it's going to need to take a step back. I mean, can you even think of all the players who played left field for the Rangers this year? If you can, then you probably have as much of a baseball problem as I do. Uh, after our last recording, actually maybe a couple of recordings ago, with Grant, he asked me if he could name all 14 of the Rangers players from memory that played left field this year. And I could. And I immediately celebrated and then said, oh no, oh no, I have a problem. This is this is a problem. This is this is not something to be celebrated. But if you can, you also have a problem. Then you're probably listening to this show uh, quite a bit, or just very, very obsessed with the Rangers. I'm ha- happy that you found this podcast. Who can who you can share your sub- obsession with the Rangers if you can name all 14. Are you ready? If you can't, then that's probably very healthy. Uh, the the most games played in left field by any Ranger this year was Bubba Thompson, who didn't come up until I believe. I want to say July, maybe it was even August. It was a long time before Bubba Thompson came up, and he has the most games in left field of anyone. It's followed by Cole Calhoun, Brad Miller, Josh Smith, Nick Solak, Eli White, Zach Rex, Charlie Culberson, Elier Hernandez, Willie Calhoun, Stephen Duggar, Steel Walker, and finally Mark Mathias with two whole games in left field. That that. That's too many. That's way too many for one position. There is there is no other position that got even close. Let's see. Uh, second base. Okay, no, no we're going to go with shortstop. Shortstop had one, two, three, four. And Charlie Culberson only played it for, um, for just a little bit. Just one game. So there were almost just three. If, if not for giving Josh Smith a little bit of run towards the end of the season, then it would have just been Marcus Simeon and Corey Seager. At second base, the Rangers had a few different players. Um, and first base, they had uh, quite a few different. Not, not Actually, not as many as I thought. I think there's just five or six uh, with Culberson and Hernandez just getting one game apiece. But but left field was the uh, biggest crap show that, that was in the majors or in this Rangers major league roster of the season, and it is still very much in question as to what's going to happen last year, next year, because I don't think we're going to see any of these guys as the primary starter next year. Um, but I do think some of them deserve to get their props. Eli White, who was out since. I want to say May. It's been a long time since he had been out with that scary collision. Thankfully, he is going to recover and be back next year. But he did a really good job while he was here. He was by far the Rangers war leader of these players who played left field, um, or at least while they were playing left field. Eli White had a 1.0 baseball reference war, which put him in the top 12 of the Rangers in general this season. He only played in 47 games. Offensive numbers were not super great. Um, He was the guy who came up in 2020 and kept lasering baseballs all over the place, but just could not find holes and ended up hitting 188 then. Well, this season he hit 200 with an on-base of 274 and slugged just 305, but the defense, oh my word, the defense. I mean, you might have forgotten, but he made that absolutely incredible home run robbing catch. That was this year. I know it doesn't feel like this year, 
but it was this year. He made a couple other amazing diving catches. He was one of the fastest players in all of baseball. He and Bubba Thompson are just right up there. And, I mean, if you got one of those guys in left field and Leoti in center and Adolis in right, or even if you had all three of those guys just stationed around at different spots in the outfield, that is by far the fastest fastest outfield in baseball maybe the fastest ever the only one that i could think of um at least in in my lifetime of of baseball watching is is back in 2012 when the angels had just signed josh hamilton so they had mike trout in left field and peter borges in center and hamilton in right and that was that was some pretty scary outfield defense but the rangers i mean with how they how they're set up in in left center and right these days uh, they they they've also got some pretty good outfield defense um and eli white i think he's going to play a part on this roster next year but uh man he he had some really great defense the offense not so much but uh you know who did better than i thought uh, offensively that was bubba thompson he used his speed at a ridiculous rate. He was um, rated as the fastest, according to sprint speed, the sprint speed rankings in MLB percentile, according to Baseball Savant. He was literally the fastest in all of baseball, and he used that very much to his advantage. Bunting quite a bit was a very good bunter, which in this day and age, I think rightfully gets gets kind of thrown aside for the most part, because unless you have just top of the scale 80 grade speed like Bubba Thompson does, then it's usually not super effective for him. But the routes that he took, um, he's gotten a lot better in the outfield since I saw him in Frisco has made quite a bit of progress offensively in hitting breaking stuff and knowing when to lay off. That is a huge, huge credit to him. He provided some value in the big leagues, even though he was rated as a zero war player, according to baseball reference. I feel like that kind of unfairly, judged how he did this year because I think he really did bring some nice things to the table. I was surprised that he wasn't just completely overmatched by major league pitching, but he wasn't. He did a fine enough job. He hit uh, 263. He had an on base of 302. The slugging was just 312. Only had that one home run. It was a, a nice one. Probably should have been two if not for the robbery in Houston, but still 18 stolen bases and just three times caught stealing seven walks in his 181 plate appearances, which doesn't sound like a lot and it's not, but for him, that is some really, really impressive stuff. And I, I am so happy that he made it to the big leagues and was able to make a contribution. And if, if we were just going with what's on the major league roster right now, or at the end of the season, I think he was most definitely the best option that the Rangers had because who oh boy were there some stinkers this year and I haven't talked about two of the guys who played who played the most left field because uh, I was saving that for the bad section which is going to be uh pretty pretty chock full of of some less than stellar things to say about some of these guys coming up we're going to get into that and some external internal and farm options for next year and what this position is going to look like but first this episode is brought to you by bet online BetOnline.net is your number one source for betting football and the start of the new basketball season. Find the latest player developments, team matchups, news, podcasts, and in-depth analysis on every single game. As as always, BetOnline is your continued source for sports waging information with live betting and up-to-the-minute scores for every sport out there. It's the fastest and easiest way to check in on all your favorite games and events, including the World Series, MMA, boxing, and golf. I talked about that World Series being everything being pushed back. Now I feel like the Phillies have a pretty darn good puncher's chance. The series is tied. They are finally in Philly, and they might get to use those dominant number one and two starters for uh, an extra, at least one extra start, and I, I think that could could really help them hang with that Astros team, so if you're feeling good about those odds, go check them out. Uh, head to the website today at Bet Online. It's where the game starts. Now, I've already talked about some of the good things that the Rangers did in left field. Honestly, there wasn't a whole lot of good. The Rangers haven't had a good left fielder since that, you know, half season of Willie Calhoun being being really exciting and impressive in in left in 2019 before injuries and uh, you know everything else that kind of came along with that. And it would have been nice that Willie, for Willie Calhoun to still be here and be you know hitting well and you know playing a well passable maybe left field and hitting tanks and dingers. But that's not the case. That is, that is not the case for Willie Calhoun because, uh, you know, he he didn't stick around like like Cole Calhoun did, who, um, 
was was not good. He was just not good. According to baseball reference, Cole Calhoun this year had a negative 1.5 baseball reference war. Negative 1.5. And, you know, he wasn't the worst one to play left field. Because Brad Miller had a negative 1.6 baseball reference war this season. And he only played in 81 games. That's really difficult to do. Now, both these guys had some really great months of May. I don't know exactly what was going on then. I feel like the baseball had just started to get unjuiced. But Brad Miller played in 24 games in May. He had five home runs, hit 258 and on base of 313, slugged 500. That was an 813 OPS for that month. And he did not have one home run after that. He had some hip issues, some other injuries that kept him uh, out of the lineup for most of the time. But for the most part, it was just poor performance that he couldn't get in the lineup. He only had two extra base hits uh, from from the time the calendar switched over to June through the end of the season. He just had two doubles, one in July and one in August. It was an incredibly rough season for him, and he's he's not good defensively in left field or really much of anywhere. He might be fine defensively at first base, but other than that, I don't think he should be playing a whole lot of left field, and I think the Rangers are probably just going to spend the, what, $5 million or whatever to buy him out of his contract because he was just that that unplayable towards the end of the season. Now, Cole Calhoun also had a really great month of May. His was even better. He had seven home runs in that month, had a 326 uh, batting average, 380 on base, and slugged 600. That was a 1,013 OPS. He also had five doubles and his one triple of the season. And looking at some of his baseball savant numbers, I for the most part, they're they're pretty terrible. I mean, he, his strikeout rate and whiff rate were in the bottom 4% of baseball, walked in the bottom quarter, was slow, chase rate, outfielder jump, outs above average, expected batting average, um, expected Woba slugging, all of those way in the blue. But somehow his hard hit percentage was in the top 11% of baseball. His average exit velo was the top 18% of baseball, which means he was hitting the ball hard. It was just going right to fielders. It might have been some of the same thing that was going on with Seager, except Seager wasn't striking out at an insane rate and not walking at all. And that was probably what's going to end up getting Cole Calhoun not not to get the Rangers to take that player option or that team option next year for him and make him a free agent. Maybe someone else will, will get him and have him be the best version of himself, but it seems like Cole Calhoun's time in Texas is done because uh, that was just not really a great showing. And, uh, well, Bubba Thompson, as much as I liked him, and I, I think that he's still got some power there, the Rangers have kind of turned him into a... Uh, you know, 1950s number two slap bunt, just get on base, maybe um, spray the ball all over the infield, kind of like they did with Elvis Andrews, who we have seen thrive a little bit with a little bit more power. But Elvis had a, a much better approach and much better recognition of off speed and at such a such a young age that he did such a great job of that. But I do think Bubba Thompson has got more power in there. I think maybe it's the right choice for him specifically because, again, his – approaches is not super duper advanced it's it's made leaps and bounds is is breaking stuff recognition has, has gotten so so much better and he is an incredible athlete and he's got a lot of raw power in there uh but i do think just kind of making him kind of try and spray it to all fields and use his speed which is is by far his best tool has been a good good option and i just don't think I, I, I'm glad to be wrong. I'm glad to be proven wrong. And I think he was definitely the best option at the end of the year with what the Rangers had. But I I don't think that he is an everyday starting left fielder. And that's not to say he's not a big leaguer and couldn't be very, very valuable as a bench player to come in um, off the bench and, and steal some bases and be a defensive replacement at times. I, I think he's definitely got that in him. But I think as an everyday starter, I don't think offensively he brings enough in left field. If he was playing center field, maybe, maybe he could do that. He could. He definitely has the the speed to challenge Leody. His jumps aren't nearly as good. Um, his arm isn't isn't nearly as good as Leody's. Leody's is really top tier, and so are his jumps. He's a little bit faster um, than Leody, Bubba Thompson that is. But I think overall, he just doesn't really have a place to start every day with the Rangers. Now on a, on another team, you can really only, uh, it, we've seen that you can really only afford to kind of punt maybe one position on offense. And with Bubba Thompson, though he does do things that are helpful offensively, overall, he's not a huge, huge boost in your lineup. So he'd have to be your number eight or nine hole hitter. And we've seen him do some, some nice things offensively. 
those those steals were were very very effective and um, I even those three times that he did get caught stealing, I I really didn't think that he was going to and it had to take a perfect throw um, or a, a bit of a mistake from him to get caught because he's just so so stupid fast. But again, I don't really think that he should be the starting everyday left fielder for the Rangers. Nor do I think Brad Miller should um, or really most of the players who played left field this year. Even that includes Eli White, and I do think that. Um, even though Eli White, I think, has a little bit better route running and maybe a little bit better of an arm, I don't know how much better. I think Bubba Thompson does bring more offense to the role than Eli White does. Coming up, we're going to look at what's happening next year with the position, some internal options, some options on the roster, and some potential free agents that the Rangers could go after to hold down that left field spot. First, let's word from our sponsors. Now, I think if you're looking at who was on the big league roster at the end of the year, Bubba Thompson was the best option, but there were not a whole lot of great options. We did see Josh Smith out there. I think he's got a lot more value as a backup shortstop slash utility outfielder. Offensively, I think he's going to run into the same kind of problems that Bubba Thompson does, but I think he's going to have a little bit better at bats. He can't use the speed nearly as well, but the lack of power that both those guys are going to display in games, I think is going to hold them back. And you might remember one option that I didn't say who who played the big league level, and that was Ezekiel Duran, who was sent down to AAA after a, a pretty decent showing at third base slash shortstop slash uh, second base. Actually, I'm not sure that he played shortstop at the big league level. Maybe he did for an inning, but um, definitely played some second base and third base and some DH. But the Rangers sent him down to AAA to get some of that outfield seasoning to play there a little bit more often. And I think that he might end up being the Rangers' best option. Mark Mathias also had a really, really great season for the Rangers in just a short, short time at the big league level. I loved what I saw from him. He was he came over in the Matt Bush trade, and offensively he did way more than I thought that he would. He had a 919 OPS in just 24 games, 74 plate appearances with five home runs. He really stepped up offensively in a short, short sample size. He can play a lot of different positions. He played uh, third base, the corner outfield. He has also been a DH for the Rangers. He, he just played pretty much everywhere the Rangers needed him, also a little bit at first base as well. In Milwaukee, he played, well, I guess just one inning in, uh, in center field. He also played some games at second base. Not that the Rangers have a whole lot of need there, but... I think his bat will keep him on the Major League roster next year, and I'd really like to see what he could do with some more playing time. Maybe he might be a better option than Bubba Thompson. I think defensively he doesn't bring quite as much as Bubba. Obviously, no one has the range of him, but offensively he really, really brought it in a small sample size, and I would love to see if that continues in a little bit of a larger sample size. He doesn't have you know crazy outstanding numbers at the minor league level. Wasn't a you know hugely, hugely big prospect. He's still 27 years old and. Basically, this is the most he's played at the major league level. He has shown the ability to hit at places at times um, in the minor leagues. Um, even in Round Rock, he did a really, really good job in just eight games there with a 946 OPS, and he has done it um, in the minor leagues um, at times in other places. But this is pretty much the best offense that he's had since his days at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo uh, back in 2014 and 15. But I'm curious if this is just a small sample size thing or if the Rangers really found something in his offense to make him tick with this new coaching staff. So I think I would really like to see him get a little bit more of a look next year if the Rangers don't go out and get something, uh, get someone, I should say, on the free agent market. But if we're looking on the farm, I think Ezekiel Duran, right now, if I was just going off of off of what I've seen from last year heading into camp, I think that he is going to probably have the best chance to win that job. What he brings offensively last year, we saw it. He's got a huge, huge arm. He is one of the faster players in baseball. Obviously not Bubba Thompson fast. Hasn't played a whole lot of outfield. Still going to be a lot of growing pains there. But we saw what he did at third base. There were some growing pains there. He hadn't played there very much at all until pretty much the Arizona Fall League last year. And then this year he played a whole lot of third and short and second. Um, and at the big league level, he pretty much just played third exclusively, but but did a really good job and held his own there. The power numbers are fantastic. He's 
pretty aggressive and he's going to swing and miss a bit and not walk quite as much as you would like. But the guy puts hard contact on the baseball time and time again. And I was really, really encouraged with what I saw from him. I think the offense and the speed, which is going to make up for the ability that he he doesn't quite have just yet in reading baseballs off the bat in the outfield, which I, I think he will get because he he's a smart kid and a, a good instinctual baseball player. And maybe, maybe there's another option to go out there and left field internally. And I think that might end up being a spot where Josh Young ends up because his arm is not great. And I have had a little bit of a blind spot for him, not as great a talent evaluator as Grant, who and some of the other guys who I've been talking to have watched um, him a little bit more at third base and seeing it a little bit more potently on display this year. His arm's not great for third base. I think he would be fine defensively at third base, but the Rangers already have two really not great options at in on the infield defensively. At shortstop, Corey Seager is just like fine and. Nathaniel Lowe, we've talked about it, is very not good. So I think that maybe Ezekiel Duran ends up at third base and you switch Josh Young to the outfield. Or if you're looking for another farm option, there is Aaron Zavala, who is getting a look in the Arizona Fall League. And I'm a little surprised that he wasn't there. Um, Their primary guy isn't playing a little bit more. But they really wanted to get a look at the younger Acuna brother who is doing a pretty good job there. But in surprise in five games, Zavala has a 829 OPS an on base of 429 slugging 400. The typical Aaron Zavala line, five walks to six strikeouts. He's a guy who gets on base at a really good clip is never off balance, has a little bit more pop than I thought was on display. Um, it really took a while for it to get on display this year. Um, really towards the you know second half of his tenure in Hickory. Showed it a little bit more in Frisco. Five home runs and eight doubles in 30 games in Frisco. Not an extreme level in the Surprise League. Uh, just one home run. That's his only extra base hit in just 21 plate appearances. But still, a very, very good balanced offensive approach. Defensively, he's he's fine. He's fine. He's a left fielder. He can be competent there and not just like a, oh, well, Willie Calhoun in his early days, which Willie Calhoun ended up being overall competent defensively. Eventually, it's not like a Mike Napoli situation out there. I think he can be fine. And if you have an elite defensive center fielder, an elite defensive right fielder, which the Rangers do at this point, then they can definitely overcome some of those lack of range factors. His arm is uh, inconsistent. Sometimes it's it's making a a zero hop or one hop throw to the plate from deep in the outfield. Sometimes it's a three pound throw to the cutoff man. Like I really can't get a good read on it. And nobody else that I've talked to that I've seen him can't get a good read on it. And I think part of the reason they sent Zavala to the fall league, even though he had 111 games during the regular season, 514 plate appearances, is that they want to be extra sure and see, is this guy ready for a look at the big league level? I'm not quite sure that he is. He's 22 years old this year. Next year will be his age 23 season. He actually just turned 22 in June. He's a 2000s baby. Ooh, makes me feel old. Probably all of you as well. But still, a solid second round pick. Had some injury issues, some injury scares. But I think if you're looking internally outside of Ezekiel Duran, of guys who are just primarily outfield prospects, I think this is a guy who could definitely step in there. The reason I didn't say Evan Carter is because I'm pretty sure Evan Carter, when he comes up, he is going to be a center fielder, depending on the level of offense the Rangers are getting from Leody Tavares in center field. But let's look at some free agent options really quickly. There are some some really good options on the market. There is Brandon Nimmo, the outfielder who has played primarily center field for the Mets this year had a 5.0 baseball reference war. I I talked about, I think on yesterday's show, about Evan Carter being kind of a Kyle Tucker-like player. I think maybe Brandon Nimmo might be a little more accurate. You kind of combine those two. They're both pretty similar players, lefty bats um, who play, who actually, yeah, 
who who throw right handed have a pretty high on base percentage. Uh, Nimmo's is a little bit higher than Kyle Tucker's, but Tucker has a little bit more power. Nimmo averages uh, 17 home runs per 162 games in his career. This year he had 16, but his on base is 385 for his career. So I think somewhere in the middle of those two outcomes is where Evan Carter could be. But Nimmo was mainly playing center field um, because he had. Um, he, I think ideally he ends up in left field. He's he's fine defensively in center field, but if the Rangers have Leody there manning center field, then I think Nimmo would probably go in left. Not that the Rangers need to spend money on an outfield position on really any offensive position, but if they're, they're going to, it's going to be to fill that left field void. And I think Nimmo is probably the best option on the market. Other options, uh, personally, Joey Gallo would love to see Joey Gallo reunion. I think it would be a real buy low. And if you wanted to give Aaron Zavala another year, you could just give him a, give Joey Gallo a one year contract to kind of rebuild some value. Cause he is still pretty young. I think this is going to be his age 30 season coming up. Um, no, his age 29 season coming up. So he is still pretty young. He has succeeded here. He could have that comfort factor to kind of bounce back to his old self and you could get him really on the cheap. Or if you wanted to give him kind of a, a two year rebuild it kind of deal or a three year deal. I think three years has got to be the most the Rangers would feel comfortable with. Personally, uh, I obviously got a very biased opinion on Joey Gallo and I would give him all of the money to stay here forever and be happy forever after. But that's not logical or realistic. So I do think a smaller pillow bounce back deal for one or two years with a team option for the next year could definitely make a whole lot of sense for Joey Gallo. Now, other options include Andrew Benintendi, who uh, was a 3.2 baseball reference for player. Another guy who's not going to have a whole lot of power, um, I should say, granted, that is comparing to what the Rangers have now, not to Joey Gallo. Um, but this year, he he did pretty well. He was was an all-star for the first time. He was a guy who I wish the Rangers had drafted at number four instead of Dylan Tate. That's a whole other story for another thing. Um, but it's won a gold glove in the past. A really, really good defensive outfielder who's got a really high on base for his career. Hits pretty well. Um, but the power, again, not a whole lot of power there. Averages 16 home runs per 162. And on base of 350 for his career and a career OPS of 782. That's kind of about in line with what he did this year. Um, a slugging percentage just under 400 for the season and hit over 300 with an on base in the 370s. So a good guy for like number seven in your order, kind of keep things moving uh, after the big guys get on base to, you know, continue some rallies, maybe get whoever is hitting eighth or ninth in your order. Maybe it's Leody to, you know, move him on base. I don't know, but a, a decent, decent option there. Might be a little more expensive than the Rangers are willing to pay, but definitely someone worth looking at. And the last one, of course, is Jock Peterson. I talked last week with uh, our Locked On Giants guy, Ben Kaspik, about what his options might be. He had a fantastic year this year. Offensively was elite. His second all-star appearance. First since he was 23 years old with the Dodgers, still a youngster back then. But offensively, he was fantastic. He had an 874 OPS this year, 23 bombs, um, three triples on base in the 350s, which is above his career average. Um, His OPS was 70 points above his career average. Set a uh, not quite a career high in home runs. I forgot that he had that 36 home run season with the Dodgers back in 2019. Somehow he wasn't an all-star that year. I don't really understand what's going on with voters then, but still a nice, nice season who does really, really well in the postseason has two different world series rings. One, one uh, with the Dodgers in 2020, then won it last year in 2021 with the uh, Braves Did not win one this year with the Giants, but still put up some solid numbers. And again, like I talked about last week, he wants to be in the postseason. So if if the Rangers can sell him on, hey, this is a postseason team, which I think if you add Jock Peterson in as like the number five, six hitter or whatever in this lineup, that's already pretty darn dangerous. I think this offense is definitely um, the offense of a team that could secure one of those wild card spots. And other than that, not a whole lot of super attractive options outside of potentially 
a reunion with Jerickson and Profar. He has a player option this year. Had an odd, was a really good leadoff hitter for uh, San Diego this year. I don't know if he would hit leadoff for the Rangers. Maybe again, he would be in that kind of seven hole. Had an on base uh, pretty high this year. Would just love to see a Jerickson Profar reunion. But again, um, turned himself into a pretty decent defensive left fielder, which is nice because he kind of had a bit of the case of the yips that moved him out of the infield this year he had a 331 on base percentage and a 723 ops with 15 homers and 36 doubles a really nice hitter for those padres a 3.1 baseball reference war overall pretty darn solid season nothing too splashy but i don't think he'd be super duper expensive and uh for me and fellow prospects heads like me it might be nice to see a jerks and profile reunion just to heal the wound of all the poor things that have happened to profile and see him hitting bombs in a rangers uniform once again that'd be a lot of fun but that's going to do it for this edition of Locked on Rangers on tomorrow's show. I think I'm going to do a review of center field. Maybe it'll be third base. I think I'm going to do both of those this week. Take a little bit of a look at what's going on at third and center. These are the three positions that are the most in question in the near and probably long-term future for the Rangers. But I think the Rangers have some pretty good options for all three of these positions internally, externally, and even some other third kind of eternally, uh, eternally, whatever. <laughs> but that's going to do it for today's show. Thank you all so much for listening. And until next time, don't forget to enjoy baseball.